The banking industry has now a complexity machine. This is an outstanding management team, an outstanding management team that runs a stellar bank. This was not these bozos over here who don't know what they're doing. This is a stellar team. When you start to look at something like this, you say, that's a sign of complexity. That's a sign of complexity. If you look at the businesses of these banks, which certainly are less complex than they were five years ago, these are enormously, enormously complex institutions. It's enormously complicated, even for insiders. So the ordinary person is just going to, you know, tune out the instant you start talking about this. And if you don't know about this, if you don't get it, there's no way to vote on it sensibly. There's no way to demand that your congressman take action. And that insulates these people from, from any kind of action. At any one time, a single credit card will have up to a hundred different interest rates for purchases, introductory offers, and cash. The central insight was that if you just really have three or four basic terms, everyone can read them. It's a really competitive market, and that means profit margins are very, very small. But if you can put things back in the fine print, and it doesn't cost you customers, but it builds revenue over time, that that becomes a model that basically revolves around complexity. Uh, let me give you a very complex product, and you won't figure out which product is the cheapest, you won't be able to make the comparisons, which product is cheapest, and you won't be able to decide in advance how much it costs you. It's impossible to implement this rule because it's 10 million pages long, and, you know, what's a hedge, what's risky proprietary trading, you have to codify all this, and you need a team of lawyers just to figure out what, what's a proper trade and what isn't a proper trade. Well, the reason we have to have all these complicated rules is because the Wall Street and the Republicans and, and some Democrats who were on board with or against reform didn't allow us to do the simple thing. The banks have ruthlessly missold complex loan deals to entrepreneurs who did not understand what they were doing. That was according to the Financial Services Authority. The four banks they name, Barclays, Lloyds, HSBC, RBS. The central banks came in and effectively added more liquidity, more fiat money, more systems complexity. Oh, say the folks in Washington. Oh, say the lobbyists. It's a lot more complex than that. You just don't understand. We need a special rule here and an extra piece there. And it takes us months, months. Actually, we're now past a year to think about this, to think it through, to talk about all of the details. Uh, the complexity machine is hard at work. And I'm just going to be blunt about the complexity machine here. The point of the complexity machine here is to create a smoke screen to permit people in Congress to be able to vote with the banks and against families and have some cover. Can you give me a, a clearer black and white definition of what a financial institution uh, is? Congressman, I can't. We have a broad definition. We got very broad authorities and powers uh, and, and I think that's appropriate. As opposed to this device which is called the modern insurance policy which no one can interpret or understand. What's even more complex is the regulatory environment that we operate in. And let me give you an illustration of that. Does anybody recognize what that is? This is paragraph 624 of the Basel II Accord for how to compute the appropriate amount of regulatory capital you need to maintain as a bank. Yeah. Now, obviously, in this audience, equations like this don't phase anybody. But remember that the folks that are supposed to be implementing this are not PhDs in nuclear physics. They're accountants, lawyers, clerks. They're not dumb, but they're, they're not trained to understand nonlinear dynamical systems and how they can interact in surprising ways. Creating an urgent crisis that can only be solved by those fluent in a language too complex for ordinary people to understand. The Wall Street crowd has turned the vast majority of Americans into non-participants in their own political future. There's a reason it used to be a crime in the Confederate States to teach a slave to read. Literacy is power. In the age of the credit default swap and the collateralized debt obligation, most of us are financial illiterates.
This uh, whole issue of securitization was central to the, the cause of the financial crisis. All of the banks, not just a few of them, all of them were engaged in this wide-scale fraud scheme to take worthless and or, or, and or extremely risky subprime mortgages and sell them uh, as AAA rated investments to unsuspecting investors all over the world, including you know pension funds here in the United States and foreign foreigners in uh, Scandinavia, China, Saudi Arabia. Basically, this was a, a fraud scheme where you're selling uh, garbage as gold, and uh, they were all engaged in this in this uh, fraud scheme. They all knew that they were selling uh, extremely risky stuff as AAA rated investments. Now. Question, how complex are these blue and orange pieces of paper, these collateralized debt obligations? Well, this is a chart that was issued by the FDIC that describes all of the elements that you need in order to issue a collateralized debt obligation. You need a mortgage broker, lender, borrower, servicer, issuer, trustee, underwriter, rating agency, credit enhancement provider, and investors. That's a lot of moving parts. Pretty complex. It's what... Rothschild had said they would make it so complicated that people wouldn't understand it until they lost everything essentially and were put under the control of one bank. So when a banker says to you your house is an asset, he's not lying to you, he's just not saying whose asset it is. <laughs> it's his asset, right? So when you go across town, you, look, you go to your friendly banker and you'll see that your mortgage is listed under what? Their asset column. So that's the fact right here, it's a mortgage here. And the way you know it's an asset, and they list it that way. I'm not telling you something that they list it that way. The way you know it's an asset is because your mortgage puts money in their pocket. Well, I think that the fair argument is that these, these investments are incredibly complicated and it's very hard to know what happened. But the fact is that we generally assume that an institutional investor like a pension fund or a hedge fund has the intelligence, the know-how, and the motivation to figure out what's going on, on the other side. And so we don't offer them the same protection as that we offer for ordinary investors. I think we can probably, we can probably assume that that's not true anymore, right? I mean, now I think we probably learned that it seems that they don't. Pension funds don't bring in the math whizzes, the quants, the people that Goldman Sachs has, they're no match for Goldman Sachs' salespeople or traders. Like again, I don't know, you know, they just said 94% of the portfolio is going to be investment grade. I have no idea, you know, where in the investment grade spectrum right. that is. Right. I interviewed a person two weeks ago, he lost $500,000 to an oil and gas scam. And he worked for an oil company. And he was a PhD in chemistry. And I can look back at a time when the world seemed a, a simpler place with uh, some sense of certainty and order. I think this is a, is a golden age of banking. You're thinking of the 60s, perhaps, or, or even the 50s. And now I was thinking more of June last year. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard of credit default swaps? Uh, no, vaguely. Well, they're a very ingenious way of insuring against companies defaulting on loans. At the end of 2006, the market in credit default swaps was $54 trillion. That's two-thirds the size of the total global economy. And the point of them is what? To decrease the risk of a crisis in financial markets. Well, did they work? No. <laughs> As it turned out, they actually increased the risk of a global financial crisis. Do I have any idea what I'm talking about? It is possible that I do not. There's an area where allegorical poetry gains a mystical influx of metaphysical certainty that is no different from the theoretical physics, where theory is just another word for things we don't want to accept as inevitable. The key to these bets were financial derivatives, products so complex that bankers could hide how risky they were. Barclays, HSBC, their stocks are getting beaten up today because for this very reason. They're not disclosing all the risks that they have on their balance sheets. And where, where is Gordon Brown? Where is Alistair Darling? Where are the leaders of these countries that, where these banks reside that are, that are not enforcing the regulatory framework necessary, at least to get minimum disclosure? To I, America. I want to know if there's anything in there that is worth the money you've been given. And I want to know what you knew it was worth and when you knew what it was worth. If it was zero, why were you doing what you were doing? We asked the chairman of the Federal Reserve 
or not we, Congress has asked the chairman of the Federal Reserve to tell us what's in the bag. What did you give the $13.9 trillion for? Ben Bernanke, when asked what's inside of this bag and why he doesn't want to say what's inside of this bag, said the following. If I disclosed what's inside the bag, it would inhibit the provision of information. This mortgage is, 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 is taken, uh, bought by a bank and p packaged together mm -hmm. uh, on Wall Street with a lot of other uh, similar debts. Without going into much detail about what is actually... Without going into any detail. No, it's far too boring. <laughs> so the banks lent all this money to yep. pump up all these houses. In lending the money, they make billions for themselves. They not only made money on the fees, but they also then securitized the debt, sold it out into a marketplace. It sounds to me a little bit like selling a car with faulty brakes and then buying an insurance policy on the buyer of those cars. Pension funds who have the life savings of police officers, These teachers. are the professional investors who want this exposure. Professional, sophisticated investors who should have known what they were getting into with mortgage-backed securities. A theme Blank Fine hit again and again. A sophisticated investor that creates the exposure that these professional investors are seeking. Again, the most sophisticated investors who sought that exposure. the Financial Services Authority, previously FIMBRA, now Financial Conduct Authority, that just changes its name anytime it gets found out in complicity and fraud. Um, these, for these hedge funds, as they're called, which specialize in these debts, um, they all have very good names. One of these funds was called the High Grade Structured Credit Strategies Fund, and the other was called the High Grade Structured Credit Enhanced Leverage Fund. <laughs> Well, that sounds very good. That's it? good, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it sounds very trustworthy. Actually, this is the, the magic of the market. What started off as lending a few thousand dollars to an unemployed black man in a string vest has become a high-grade structured credit enhanced leverage fund. <laughs> it is high-grade. It's a master fund that must be good, right? It's structured. It's enhanced. I like the sound of it. It, it is good. Well, it sounds very trustworthy. I mean, it's got good words in it. It's got yes. words I like. High. High is good. High is good. <laughs> yes. Better than low, anyway, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and structured is another good word. Very good. Enhanced. Is I love enhanced. Enhanced is very good. I mean, I'd buy anything if it said enhanced. Yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It might have been different if it said the unemployed black man in the string best fund, but... but, 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 but <laughs> yes, because then uh, alarm bells might alarm such. Is, <laughs> might be. Why are you talking about this fund? because it was the name of one of the two notorious hedge funds that brought down Bear Stearns in 2008. Before the firm collapsed, it had been receiving praise as being one of the most admired companies in the United States. The mortgage bubble was the, the key thing that led to the entire financial crisis, and it's very, very complicated, but uh, after two years of covering this, I finally... I think reached the point where I can uh, explain this in, in relatively simple terms. A lot of uh, uh, mortgage uh, have been uh, loans have been uh, securitized and packages, which have been sold all over the world. Was finally at the, the end a buyer, not knowing at all what he did buy. So uh, when uh, you know uh, a German bank, for instance, buys to an American bank. Uh, 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 structured product in which you have 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent of housing uh, uh, mortgage from the United States. This guy in Germany has no idea at all of what's going to happen in the housing market in Maryland. So he buys something, he doesn't know exactly how it will behave. And so uh, the basic principle of the banking system, which is that uh, you take into account the risks you, 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 may, you may have, was broken. You, you, the, the, the German banker, in my example, was just unable to have a, an estimate of, of, of the risks. Oh, bankers think that they have managed to split the atom of risk from the atom of reward. They keep all the reward, we keep all the risk. So uh, the idea was that uh, if those risks are disseminated everywhere, in small pieces, in small packages, then you avoid the problem because, uh, of course, you may have some uh, downturn and you may have some risk materializing,
but it means that everybody will share a little part of the river. That was the first part of the problem. The second thing is they invented these fancy derivative tools like CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, that allowed them to take those buckets full of chopped up loans and divide them up into tiers uh, where you had AAA ratings on what sometimes were entire buckets full of subprime loans. It's complicated, but the essence of it is uh, you could take subprime loans and sell them off as AAA rated securities that were, that, and AAA means credit risk almost zero. So you took something that's actually worth very, very little and you sold it as something that's worth a lot. Well, the analysts who work for the credit rating agencies aren't very well paid. They get very small bonuses, so all the smart people are left for the banks and the hedge funds. So, as the FT once again said, leaving second-rate employees to rate complex deals they didn't understand. So, uh, you're saying it wasn't criminal, it was stupidity. Stupidity and incompetence, that's all. <laughs> and that's something we can be very proud of. <laughs> Well, you can say it's a good thing that, that, um, that people haven't got the illusion of, of AAA safety. Very few credits now in the world have AAA, which means that the collateral holding up the devil's derivatives, the, the really the biggest Ponzi scheme of all. If you thought Amway was a Ponzi scheme, it's nothing compared to the devil's derivatives. One intent of the film is, is to make it clear that this is not a subject that is so complicated and technical that average people can't understand it or, uh, or hold political opinions based on what occurred. In fact, it's really quite simple what happened. It was, it was a bank robbery, and it was a bank robbery committed not by somebody walking into a bank with a gun, but committed by the president of the bank. So how are they robbing us? Allow me to explain how our private banks and government work today. Uh, it's, it's inherently difficult because the Fed is a complicated institution and as you've seen in the last uh, four lectures, these are not simple issues. Um, but all we can do, I think, is do our best and hope that um, uh, our educators and our media and so on will, you know, begin to uh, carry the story and uh, help people understand better. When you have a systems in place, complicated systems, as they grow, their complexity grows exponentially. And this is the problem. We saw this in 2008, but instead of dismantling the complexity of the system to stop this from happening again, what we see is an increase in the complexity, therefore guaranteeing another a collapse, but a collapse much more severe. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, there is absolutely no aptitude anywhere to fix problems by simplifying what we have. Every single solution is a graft onto the existing system. Um, a new system, a new piece of legislation, uh, a new piece of complexity. So if the problem is that the system we have is too complex, and the solution is to make it even more complicated, then it's pretty easy to predict what the final outcome is going to be. If the banking sector is growing, it's either that it's becoming less efficient, or it's becoming a parasite on the rest of the economy. What's fundamentally unfair about the collapse of Lehman is its impact on the economy and taxpayers. Mr. Fold will do fine. He can walk away from Lehman, a wealthy man who earned over $500 million. Nobody has perfect market timing. And timing is everything when it comes to these kind of decisions. Someone once said that the difference between salad and garbage is timing. <laughs> but what I'm going to show you is that I'm going to create two children from these two ugly parents, one of whom will be a beautiful supermodel, and the other will be a deformed Quasimodo. <laughs> and that will be the magic of securitization. It's a different color for a reason. It's a different color because it's junior to the blue bond, meaning the orange bond is second in line. The blue bond has to be paid first before the orange bond can get its payment. And that's part of the contractual agreement. To change the rules so that the banks no longer have to recognize the losses on these toxic loans they make unless and until they actually sell them. That means that they don't have to recognize currently 
over a trillion dollars in losses. So think, if they had to recognize over a trillion dollars in losses, what would happen to all these reported profits? And you can't pay the bonuses without the reported profits. So again, they're taking stuff off the bank's balance exactly. sheet. It's part, part of the derivatives book. Mm -hmm. And saying, here you guys take exactly. it. Exactly. But personally, I would go further than that. I have a very simple solution to the whole problem. Uh, um, and that is that I would abolish all uh, bankers' bonuses straight away now. Well, that's very radical. With one proviso. Which is? That all bankers receive full compensation for loss of earnings. And that's fair, wouldn't you say? They will tell us that we need them, and that what they do is too complicated for us to understand. It's really not that complicated. The details are complicated because it's a complicated industry, but, but the underlying principles are really very simple. Uh, the bank would borrow from the Fed at zero and then you know, lend to, lend, they'd actually borrow from the, from, from the Fed at 0% interest rates, and then they would lend the money back to the government at 3% interest rates. Uh, you know, they always say that, oh, we deserve to make all this money because we're so smart. We're the smartest guys in the room, and nobody else can do this job as well as, as we can. But what, you don't need to be a genius to borrow from the government at three and lend back to the government, bar, I'm sorry, borrow from the government at zero and lend back to the government at three. Through magic is to show how a single investment bank can make three billion dollars in cash in three months' time and create absolutely no value. In fact, it's better if you look <clears throat> like a very trustworthy man in a suit. First, they invented this process called securitization, by which you can take not one mortgage, but a whole bunch of them, hundreds or thousands, put them in a big bucket, chop them up, and make them into securities. That uh, method allowed lenders to take their loans and then sell them off to somebody else on the secondary market. The second thing was they invented uh, derivative instruments uh, like CDOs and CMOs. Everybody here heard of collateralized debt obligations or collateralized, okay, a few. Uh, basically, these were uh, fancy uh, mathematical instruments, and here's how they worked. You take a giant pool of subprime loans. Don't worry about that, because according to our calculations, at least this much of the bag is going to be filled with money. They came up with what's called securitization. And uh, how does that work? It's absolute magic. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is put into a package of debt, and so, and then it's moved on to Wall Street, and this, this is it's extraordinary what happens then, that mm -hmm. somehow this package of dodgy debt stops being a package of dodgy debts and starts being what we call a structured investment vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, SIV? And SIV, exactly, yes. yes. And you take all those thousand loans and you throw them in a, in a big bucket, and you chop them up into little pieces so you can sell them individually as securities to people. And what they did is they kind of applied, with these derivatives, they applied a sort of magic wand to the whole bucket and did this hocus pocus math by which they essentially said, well, 99.9% .9 of the time, 26% of these loans are never going to fail. Or we're going to get 26%, at least 26% of the money that's owed into this bucket uh, every month. So let's peel off that 26% part and sell that as a AAA rated security to some trade union in Iceland or uh, a German land bank or the state pension fund in Massachusetts or uh, an insurance company. And by that magical process, you take crappy loans that really are not even, not, not only not AAA, they're not even B, they're actually uh, C rated or, or you know, what they call junk rated loans, and they apply this math to them and they'll get a portion of it that's actually AAA. And you don't have to wait 30 years for the money. Precisely. Uh, but a risky loan is still a, a risky loan, isn't it? Not if you pass it up with a lot of other loans and some other loans are of good quality. If you do that, the bad loans somehow get better. <laughs> All on their own? 
Sort, sort of all on their own, yes. I mean, we're in very deep waters here mathematically. I mean, the, the people who devise these financial instruments are incredibly clever. That's what people don't understand about this mortgage crisis. Most people think of it as some, you know, airy abstraction, you know, bankers ripping off bankers. That's not what it is. It's bankers stealing from old ladies and retirees. That's what it is. They, they essentially went to pension funds and they said, here's a whole bunch of relatively safe, you know, AAA rated investments. AAA, that's the same as a United States T-bill or, you know, the, the sovereign debt of Luxembourg or something like that. It just earns you a little bit more, but it's also AAA. They bought this stuff and then, you know, a year or two later, they're looking at 30, 40, 50 percent losses. And that's just money that's coming straight out of the pockets of old people and retirees. The problem about lending money to people who haven't got the glimmer of a chance of paying it back is that there's a risk. That they won't be able to pay it back. No, no, that's not a risk, that's a cast iron certainty. No, no. The risk is that in some very complicated way the bank will lose money. Now, what happens with securitization? You see, before securitization, um, we could see the risk. We, it, was, it was there, we had it, you see. Yes. And then after securitization, what that did was, woo, the risk was sort of. Out there somewhere, somewhere. nobody knew. You know? no. No, but then we look back and remember, my God, it was still there after all. We're going to sell you this portion of the bag, and we're going to call that a AAA rated security. All right? And it was packaging them into securities and selling them to institutional investors. These would be pension funds, uh, foreign banks, uh, union health funds. Wouldn't it be better if there was some independent agencies which could help just set the price of these very complicated financial instruments. Well, there are. There are. There are firms like Standard and & Poor's and Moody's which put a credit rating on different forms of investment and get paid a fee. Well, who pays their fee? Whoever is selling the investment. <laughs> <laughs> and these investors were getting what they thought were AAA securities, AAA bonds that paid high yields and that would be safe. No chance of paying them back. Yeah, well, of course, it's easy to see that now. <laughs> but actually, what it what it happened, as we all know now, is that these uh, mortgage underlying mortgages that were backing up these bonds were were not that far from junk. Because some idiot somewhere asked a question that should never have been asked, which was what? Which was how much are these things worth? <laughs> how do you sell loans that aren't worth anything? quite easily, if they are marketed well and beautifully presented. Especially, when sitting in a nice comfortable chair, being presented with a glossy brochure by a well-dressed sales representative. Well, something doesn't seem right. It's very attractive. Look at the words. Use good quality paper, fund managers just love this sort of thing. But aren't they just rubbish? Well, no, Julia. They look good and are given very technical sounding names, like collateralized debt obligation, or mortgage backed securities, or structured investment vehicle. But that doesn't change anything. It most certainly does. Julia, if I presented you with some paper and told you they were a bunch of dodgy loans that will likely never be paid back, would you buy them? Of course not. Exactly. Exactly what, Mr. Lloyd? What do you think about selling securities which your own people think are crap? Does that bother you as a hypothetical? No, this is real. In the boardrooms of some of the biggest New York and, and global investment banks, leaders of these companies sat down and deliberately decided to have uh, create these uh, packages of mortgages but then they came on the quantifying the, the, the quants as they're called quantitative analysis and deep deep technical programmers and they developed a patch essentially to allow for not any reform of the banking system That's right. not any jailing of corrupt bankers but they decided they created a bigger derivatives ball. That was the result of all that. Am I correct, Steve? Absolutely. They knew that someone in California borrowing money to buy this house would never be able to pay, but they knew if they packaged these all together and resold them to their client investors, they would make killings in their bonuses, and they would create layer on layer of investment packages that got more and more complex. But with derivatives, really, 
you're talking about a bet or an option on an option, and then we have five, six, seven, eight, ten generation derivatives where there's a bet on a bet on a bet on a bet until the point where the bets are all self-referential and in fact it becomes a financial hologram. Now this is the world market here in sure. my left hand. This is the global derivative market. I mean, this is, you know, about six times as big. But now we're at now 2016. So the first one was 2000, the second one was 2008. We are now today. And what has effectively have happened now, we've got a derivatives market, which is effectively a, a global derivatives market, which is effectively now 1.5 quadrillion, which is 1,000 Five hundred trillion dollars. Effectively, that is that is in, in, in theory six times the actual global trading markets. Everybody from the very bottom uh, part of the, uh, you know of this whole sequence to the very top. You had, at the very bottom, you had individual lenders who were faking credit scores and telling people who qualified for thirty-year fixed loans that they should get into much much riskier option adjustable ARM loans, uh, people who did the, who inflated the appraisals, the appraisers were corrupt. Uh, of course, the, the lenders like Countrywide uh, were completely corrupt. They knew that they were selling uh, stuff that had not been uh, properly researched. This is why Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein are billionaires, because they get a fee on this big frickin' ball. Absolutely. They're big swinging balls. And Absolutely. they get a fee on the big swinging ball, and, that's, and they knock things over, and when they knock it over, they go to the government and says, either give us some more money to bail these things out, or we're gonna swing this ball even bigger. Under so-called quantitative easing, it printed 200 billion pounds, and in effect, gave it to the banks. But most of the money hasn't reached British companies. The bankers have used this near free money from the government for business as usual, lending on property and speculating in the financial markets. As our own research has shown, British banks direct money into property and derivative trading, but not into British business and entrepreneurship. I feel as if America has suffered the greatest theft and cover-up yep. ever. And that, yep. the, that the vehicle was this right here. Absolutely. Where banks created a pile of garbage. Yep. That they paid themselves billions of dollars in personal compensation and then stuck the trillions of dollars worth of garbage with the American taxpayer. Were, were, that to me is stealing. You were so right. There was America and Wall Street created toxic debts and toxic packaged securities using what they call financial engineering, which is a euphemism for packaging garbage and selling it like it's something other than garbage, except people are not used to the idea that you can create financial garbage. They think that all of finances are clean and squeaky and that money is somehow pure in its own right. They don't understand that you can actually create toxic garbage and toxic derivatives by re-engineering money so that it performs like a virus. Once these banks in Europe, for example, got these American debts, the debts uh, festered and they compounded their interest cost and they put these banks at great disadvantage. This is part of the American methodology to uh, expand the American imperium around the world is by getting countries to swallow these toxic bonds manufactured by Paulson, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, Tim Geithner, the whole list that we are familiar with of the toxic Avengers wielding toxic weapons of mass financial destruction. A banking breakthrough called structured finance, which turned risky loans into supposedly safe investments. This is how it works. Here are three risky subprime borrowers. 
And over here are three investors who buy investments created from their mortgages. One investor loves risk, one likes a bit of risk, and another hates taking risks and wouldn't normally lend to a subprime borrower. Now here's the great innovation known as structured finance which persuades the low-risk investor who controls billions to lend to our subprime borrowers. I'm a clever banker. Well, let's pretend. And I'll mix these three mortgage loans together and create three new investment opportunities. To Mr. No Risk, the pension fund manager, I promise that he'll get first dibs on whatever cash is received from these three borrowers. And because he's getting first dibs on the cash, he thinks the money he's investing or lending is as safe as can be. To Mr. Medium Risk, the investment banker, I promise that he'll get the second bite. And the lover of risk who runs a hedge fund, she'll get whatever's left over. In the unlikely event all my borrowers pay on time, the three investors all do very nicely. If one borrower gets into difficulties, well, we sort of assumed that would happen, and my investors are still pretty happy. But if none of them pay, then they're all facing losses and are pretty upset, especially Mr. No Risk. Individuals, often those with the worst of credit histories, were given the opportunity to borrow to own that cherished home. They were known as subprime borrowers, and there were truly frantic attempts to lend to them. The ads would be, you know, literally, you know, just released from prison, never had a job, can't document that you, you know, are even a citizen. Please come down. We would like to make a mortgage for you. It was like Einstein's E equals MC squared to the degree that for the first time, energy and mass were separated, and you could trade on energy exclusively and create an atomic weapon. Here with the derivatives market, when they came up with the options volatility formula, they could say, well, risk is separate from reward. We can trade risk separately. We can package risk. We can leverage risk. And you end up with this enormous derivatives ball that's unregulated. Сам Пункаре за пять лет до Гильберта да. в 895 году опубликовал теорию относительности за 10 лет до Эйнштейна. И дальше была вся теория относительности, но только. Это был философский журнал, в котором Пункаре не опубликовал формул, кроме только одной формулы. Формула атомной бомбы Е равно МС квадрат уже была в этой работе. Well, we call them banks, but I think really banks have a very narrow connotation. I really think we ought to talk about financial intermediaries. This is a constant theme of modern Wall Street, is that all these banks have managed to arrange in every corner of the financial universe a system by which uh, they have official middleman status or some kind of protected status that allows them to get in between necessary transactions so that they always get a cut. If uh, you and I want to, uh, for instance, buy U.S. Treasuries, so we can't just go and officially do it from the, from the Fed, uh, we have to buy them through uh, one of these banks that is an official registered primary dealer uh, for the Federal Reserve. So instead of us directly borrowing from the government at zero, we go through a bank which itself borrows from zero, and we borrow from the bank at five or six or 15 or 20. Or if you, any of us in this room want to go and buy oil, oil futures, we can't just go and do it. We have to go to one of these companies that owns one of these exemptions from the government, and they have the permission to go and buy oil, oil futures for us. So every time anybody buys uh, commodities or invests in commodities, they have to go through this official government, government middleman, and the banks always get their cut. Uh, and it's basically free money. They don't have to compete for it at all. We live in a, a snow globe of fraud. It, it's all around us. It's, it's fraud to a new level, Stacy, because it's synthetic fraud. It, it's, it's a synthetic fraud cooked up in the algorithmic laboratories of these big banks, quantitative 
uh, analysis bucket shops on Wall Street in the city of London. It's not even real fraud. You don't even have the benefit of, let's say, if it's fake food, at least you can pretend that it's getting some nourishment. But this is fake fraud, fake synthetic fraud. Of course, it's dominating global commerce and squeezing out all legitimate activities in toto. They're just making up numbers, telling some clients, and the clients say, buy, sell, buy, sell, based on these numbers that they just pull out magically from thin air. Well, right, but those numbers that they pull magically out of thin air are the collateral that backs derivatives. The derivatives, we know, for definitively, are backed by magical thinking. They themselves are algorithmic bots that are referencing each other, and now it's going to be informed by magical thinking. Magical thinking informs a LIBOR rate. Right, and then it places honest companies at, a, at an active disadvantage right. because they're expending all this energy trying to conform and make all the numbers r really add up, whereas this other company can just make up all the numbers and, and go to investors and say, uh, here's some numbers that we just cooked up and you're free to believe them or not. And so there's no emphasis now on being honest and actually conforming to the rules. Everybody in the market had confidence in absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me put it another way. Not everybody in the market had confidence in it. In fact, nobody did. The key thing is, we all behaved as if we did. <laughs> didn't it worry you that you didn't understand these things, these CDOs, or the formulas? Of course it didn't. In fact, it would have worried me if I had. Because <laughs> if I could understand it, anybody could. Not just the quantification experts who worked for me. And if anybody could, then anybody could make billions like me. And where would that leave us all? <laughs> so, the point is, you believed in these things. I believed in them, and more important, I believe that everybody else believed in them. I mean, it's like religious faith. So why do these financial intermediaries exist? What is the problem that they're trying to solve that can't immediately be solved by direct finance? The problem is one economists call asymmetric information. Well, I worked on Wall Street, and it's rampant. Um, most, of the, most of the times you call somebody to do a deal, it's because you're calling them with information that you believe to be inside information. So 100% of all the deals are done based on a belief that these deals are being done on inside information. Not all of it is inside information, but everyone believes that they are trading on inside information. They know that if they get caught, that the laws will change to accommodate the crime. And once you give them the money, how do you know that they will follow through with the obligations that they made to you? Financial intermediaries specialize in this sort of information. They specialize in being able to distinguish between the good loans and the potentially bad loans. And Turns out Goldman Sachs was doing business with Muammar Gaddafi. In fact, they had gotten uh, $1.3 billion from him uh, and had him invest it through Goldman Sachs. You know how much of it they lost? 98%. If you do business with Goldman Sachs, you are a sucker, man. <laughs> you think they care about their clients? Now, in this case, they ripped off Gaddafi. So, great, fantastic, everybody wins, right? But, I mean, these guys, if you think they're in it for their clients, you're great. You think Goldman Sachs ever loses 98% on an investment they make for themselves? Oh, no, no, no. That's not how it works. This is a very difficult undertaking, and an undertaking that most of us can't do. Banks do it for us. For years, bankers have maintained that they are the cleverest people in Britain, and the politicians have believed them. The important thing is that to get back into some kind of um, um, stability, the panic has to be stopped, whatever it costs. Stopped. Oh no, don't tell me how it should be stopped by giving the banks enormous amounts of money. That's, well, that's always a good thing, isn't it? The same guys who created the problem. He wrote them a check for $20 trillion, and what did they do? They said, yeah, baby, this is what we're going to do. We're going to create the biggest freaking derivative nightmare ever the world has ever known. Let's put it in there, Steve. It's so big. Lloyd Blankfein told the Times of London, we're very important. We help companies to grow by helping them to raise capital. And that he was just a banker doing God's work. Check it out. The only time that Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, becomes violent is when he picks up a whip to drive the money changers out of the temple. Is What we do a lot for the economy isn't that visible as an investment bank. We help allocate capital, we raise, we, do, we put companies together, we launch new businesses. 
So that's how Goldman Sachs is supposedly making money. Classical investment banking function is, is a very small portion of their revenues. I think it's about 10% or so. so. So if he's doing God's work, he's only doing it at 10% capacity. Most of the rest, says Prince, is so-called proprietary trading for the firm's own account rather than its clients. Totally legitimate services, for sure. Uh -huh. And more bond underwriting, they make more money. More stock, they make more money. Makes sense. But then there's this last item. $10 billion in a single quarter from what they call trading and principal investments. So what does that mean? Goldman Sachs doesn't exist without taxpayer help. Period. Yeah. But because we actually allow them to continue to exist and we supply them with all this money, they take the money and buy all these assets. Then put 23.7 trillion U.S. dollars underneath the entire U.S. economy. You have to equate these guys with any terrorist who claims they're doing God's work and they refuse to give any details. They just say, oh, we're blowing ourselves up because we're doing God's work. And Blank Fine and Geithner and Paulson say, well, we're blowing up the economy, we're doing God's work. No, the bottom line is they're greedy and they're just stealing money and there's nobody in government, who's, who, including Obama, who has, who's put any enforcing the laws to stop wholesale thievery and theft, and that's tyranny. Bankers gambled. They lent. They dreamt up new products, and the more successful they were, the more it justified still more gambling. Uh, it would seem that it's a very small elite uh, that are continuing to benefit from all this. Absolutely. It's an elite. It's an elite of the top zombie bankers in the world. The more risk that they take, the greater the rewards they get. Derivatives are essentially cheap bets in which two parties, banks or companies, gamble on future movements in financial prices. Supposedly, they help the buyers or sellers manage risk. Some do, but many are no more than invitations to speculate on a massive scale. These are people who sit at desks in front of television screens, two telephones in their hands, shouting at each other. They, on the whole, think that they're quite talented. You have to remember two things about the market. One is that they are made up of very sharp and sophisticated people. Mm. And we all know, property, over time, only goes up in price. Unless it goes down. Well, what everybody thought was, uh, it didn't really matter if things went wrong, or if we made mistakes, or if people defaulted on their mortgages. Why not? Because property values would go on rising and all the mistakes would be cancelled out. <laughs> I've been working in the city for 40 years, and if I've learned nothing else, and I have learned nothing else, <laughs> it is there is an absolute rule that property values never go on rising forever. That's the rule. That's an Is absolute it? rule. They never have and they never will. Only a complete idiot would think otherwise. Right. Except <laughs> that just this once we thought they would. <laughs> Why was money lent to people who couldn't pay it back? Quite simply, because the people who could pay it back already have money and don't require a loan. Although there are some things, some new things coming into the city which everybody's getting very enthusiastic about. You're not serious. What things? They're called re-remixes. But they sound just the same as CDUs. Oh no, they're completely different. Well, <laughs> well, actually they're nearly the same, but there are crucial differences. The mortgages won't be ones sold to people with no income. Well, that's a relief. Just to people who can't prove their income. <laughs> Our aim is to make what the Bank of England does in the economy extremely boring. We don't want to be the source of great excitement or news in the economy. They're, they're choking the real economy to save the banksters. I mean, that the way that this is being positioned is that, oh, the lending window is open, but it's not open. It's, it's being um, re-architected in a way to perpetuate this two-tier economy of a permanent uber class uh, that gets access to cash for relatively free uh, and everyone else is paying usurious rates of payday lending 50, 60, 70 percent. So we don't want to be in the news, we want to be seen as boring. What you're saying is that you can ask 
for any amount of public funds at any time you want. No, 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 no that would be ridiculous. No, no, <laughs> we, 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 we didn't that. We asked for the Bank of England to swap their real money with these CDOs and things which have all the uh, incontinent grandfathers in, in it. You think the Obama administration should break the financial companies that are in crisis down? Stop letting them get so complex that they can't be understood and they can't be regulated. То, что я объясняю об этом, точно не знают. И вы знаете, я понимаю, почему не знают. Потому что Обама не знает о том, что Subprime Debt является крупнейшей аферой мировой. Потому что они не знают, что происходит внутри Goldman Sachs. Don't forget that Goldman Sachs made about 3.5 billion profits. So the shareholders are benefiting from this. But they were given 3.5 billion from but, taxpayers in America. They called it a profit. They, made them. they, they, made they them. didn't make them, they oh, stole them. Uh, the people who argue that LIBOR manipulation rates going down saved me $300 on my mortgage last year fail to include the big picture that they lost $300,000 in equity of their home. So they lost $300,000, but they made $300,000. And it's just like the guy who gets ripped off by the three-card Monty scam in Times Square. At the end of the scam, he always gives you back $20. Bucks. So you go away because your mind says, you see, I made $20. I lost $2,000. But that's forgotten. I made 20. So the banks are smart. They stole 300,000 equity from your home, but they gave you 300 bucks and you're like, well, I'm, I'm a winner. Let me just read uh, a comment that the CEO of ba Bank of America made, uh, Kenneth Lewis. So um, he said, quote, we are doing our best to manage the interests of shareholders, consumers, and taxpayers. Well, there's something wrong with this. Bank of America and Citibank each took $45 billion of cash. In addition, the government backstopped over $100 billion in troubled assets for these firms. Without this cash, in cash injection, the value of the equity of Citigroup and Bank of America would be zero. The shareholders are lucky that there's any value whatsoever. The major stakeholder in Bank of America and Citigroup is the U.S. taxpayer. Yet we're number three on the list, and that doesn't make any sense. So management is acting in the best interest of the shareholders. Shareholders number one. And that doesn't make any sense because they are actually a smaller stakeholder than the government. So that's a lie, it's an underlying lie. But I want to talk about derivatives in another sense. And it goes to the definition of capitalism itself. In, in capitalism, you've got entrepreneurs taking risks by investing capital. And the amount of reward that is expected in a capitalist equation has some commensurate tie to some quantity of risk. And people who are willing to take risk have the potential to make rewards and they may fail, in which case they, the risk is borne by the, the entrepreneur. And, um, but uh, we encourage the continuation of this in the hopes that some will be successful. So you have the, one of my point is that you've got a, a connection between risk and reward that's not too difficult to understand. But with derivatives, and the growth of derivatives, that relationship has been destroyed. Because now you have capitalists or bankers who are applying, making bets, but not taking any risk. And that's a huge problem because it, it totally upsets the whole definition of what capitalism is about. Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan is not a capitalist because he's making riskless bets, reaping the rewards when he's right, and when he's wrong, society ends up underwriting the cost. That's not, has anything to do with capitalism. Where right. capitalism is dying, but Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, or uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, Barclays, are siphoning off the cash and the integrity, just like anybody sticking a tube into somebody's gas tank and siphoning off the equity. That's what they're doing.
Brushing aside the external differences affecting the shells, we find the kernels of the two systems very closely resembling and related to one another. But that admission was for private consumption only. Publicly, the Money Trust trotted out Senator Aldrich and Frank Vanderlip, the president of Rockefeller's National City Bank of New York and one of the Jekyll Island Seven, to oppose the new Federal Reserve System. Years later, however, Vanderlip admitted in the Saturday Evening Post that the two measures were virtually identical. Although the Aldrich Federal Reserve Plan was defeated when it bore the name Aldrich, nevertheless, its essential points were all contained in the plan that finally was adopted. The price was high. A government-sanctioned, privately-owned bank, which could issue money created out of nothing. It was to be the modern world's first privately-owned central bank, the Bank of England. Although it was deceptively called the Bank of England to make the general population think it was part of the government, it was not. The beauty of the plan is that not one person in a thousand can figure it out because it's usually hidden behind complex-sounding economics gibberish.